Today on Run With Horses, we're moving on to stage two of spiritual growth. Thanks for moving forward with me. My name is Norman, and my goal is to help you run your race well, not just surviving, but thriving as a disciple of Jesus. There are a lot of things you can do with your life, but I don't think anything compares with following Jesus and joining Him on His mission of bringing hope to the nations. Welcome to Run With Horses, and thanks for including me on your journey. Well, today's focus is moving beyond ourself to thinking about others, and that's really the difference between the stage one and the stage two. When we begin our spiritual journey, we are infants or children, really, in our spiritual life. In the same way that a an infant or a child is primarily going to be uh, selfish. I mean, they they have to think about themselves. The infant, they need food. The only way they know to get it is to draw attention to themselves. And uh, children are often self-focused and on their wants and their desires. In the same way that we expect a child to begin to grow and to to begin to think about other people, in our spiritual life, we have to grow to that point as well. In this second stage, we're making that transition from very self-centered thinking about ourself in a good way. We're in the first stage we were thinking about our identity in Christ and how God made us, but we're thinking about sacrifice and service as a foundation for ministry. So I introduced the three stages of spiritual growth as they relate to your spiritual life and ministry, and we're going to look at the second stage, sacrifice and service today. So let me know if you have questions or comments as we go along. You can write me at Norman at runwithhorses.net. I'd love to hear your comments, questions, and let me know where you're at. You know, I'm seeking to continue to grow. And like I mentioned in the beginning of this, we don't get beyond these stages. They're foundational. So the things you learn in stage one, you don't ever grow away from. The things that we learn in stage two, we don't ever get away from. So don't think that you've got it and you've moved on and now those things don't matter anymore. You still need those lessons from the first stage and we will still need those lessons from the second stage as we go forward. So the first stage, just as a reminder, we were looking at our spiritual identity and building that foundation that we need for a good, solid spiritual life. So we're learning who we are in God's sight. Who does God say that I am? What does the Bible say about a follower of Jesus? What are the basics of the Christian life? What does it mean to follow Jesus. So part of that is developing good spiritual habits for the future. The second stage, you're building on that foundation where in the beginning of our spiritual life, it's kind of necessarily involves a lot of work on ourselves. You know, you recognize I've got problems. <laughs> I've, I've got sin in my life. I've been uh, developed a habit of making poor choices. Well, you have to do that work on yourself. But to continue to grow, at some point in time, if you don't work on, if you don't make that transition, you continue just to think about yourself, you become self-centered, you will stop growing. So to continue to grow, you have to begin to think about others. You have to be properly oriented toward other people. One of the lessons that I learned many years ago that came from a pastor who was kind of helping disciple me and helping me in ministry is that Christianity can really be summarized at its simplest, at its core. You could say Christianity equals relationships. And there are three primary relationships that you have there. First, your relationship with God. Well, how did you get into this first stage of spiritual growth that we're talking about? You came to know Jesus. Your relationship with God went from one of an enemy to a friend one from an alien, an outsider, to one of a family member. Your relationship with God has completely changed. You were under God's wrath. Now you are embraced in God's love and acceptance, and you're declared righteous by what Jesus did. So your relationship with God then sets the framework for all of your other relationships. Your relationship with His family, the church, then becomes a primary important relationship as we understand what God has done. As God, through the work of Christ, through the finished work of Christ on the cross, as He saved us, as He brought us into His family, He united us with a special group of people. He calls, he calls us a royal priesthood. He, he really invites us into this family. We have new relationships that we didn't have before. There's also another set of relationships. 
And that's the relationships with the world, people who aren't yet following Jesus. This would be what you were before you came to know Christ. So you still have a relationship with the world, but it also has changed. The thing about these three primary relationships is that all three of them are impacted and changed by your relationship with Christ. You accept Christ, you begin to follow Him, your relationship with God has changed. You are now one of His family. You are part of His family, you're part of the church, you're now into this group that you were not in before. You were an alien, now you're an insider. And your relationship with the world has also changed. You were part of this group of people who were aimless and purposeless and destined for destruction. And now, what's your relationship with them? Well, now, one of the things we begin to understand in stage two is that God has given me an opportunity to go back to this group of people with the message that I've understood. God loves them. God cares about them. God wants them to be in right relationship with Him and His church. We begin to understand what God is doing in the world, and He has called me to be part of it. So this foundation we started in stage one, it continues into stage two. We've built ourselves. We've, we've built these relationships. We're continuing in those, and now we're beginning to live those out in a new way. So what exactly are we talking about? Well, there's a lot... A lot to it, actually, and we're not going to cover it all today, but there are four things that I think are worth talking about, maybe in a little more detail today. I see us building on the foundation we started. We placed our faith in Christ in four ways. One is learning how to relate to others in a biblical way. In the beginning, you're learning what God says about you. Well, as you're learning what God says about you, you also, at some point in time, have to recognize God says this about other people, too where God says He loved you and you didn't deserve His love, that His grace was offered to you, you recognize that, wow, God loves those people too. And how we treat them in and out of the church should reflect God's love for them. So we can be selfish and just say, well, God loves me, and we just really rejoice that God loves me and be overjoyed that God loves me. But the truth is God loves other people too. And we are His hands and feet in the world. God gives you the opportunity to show other people that He loves them and to show them how He loves them. We have an opportunity to be part of His mission of reconciliation and to use our gifts, the things that He has given us, to build up the body. Uh, That's an awesome part of being part of the body of Christ. God has given us a great opportunity, responsibility, privilege to help the body of Christ grow to be what God wants it to be. So to do that... We need to be growing in the character of Jesus. A selfish, unregenerate heart really cannot treat people as God wants them to be treated. So until we follow Jesus, until we accept Him as Savior, until we are made a new creature, we cannot treat people as God intends for them to be treated. The foundational heart change that we saw in stage one that baptizes us into this new body of believers also gives us a new nature that is directed by the Holy Spirit to genuinely love others and to consider their needs. So there are a, there are just a ton of passages that talk about this relationship that we have and the first ones that, that comes to mind that I don't have on my sheet. I was thinking about the Good Samaritan. It's like That's a good picture of, of loving other people. You have this uh, man who was an outsider, but he doesn't think about that when he sees someone in need. He does his part to help. He does his part to serve. I want to look at three passages that I I think are important that I keep going back to and I keep struggling because I I realize it is very difficult to live these out. It's not complicated to understand them. They're very simple concepts, but they're very difficult to live. The first one is from Philippians 2.3. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Look at those two phrases. Consider others better than yourself. Oh, man. (laughs) I understand what that means. But, man, that's hard to do. And particularly when we look at someone else and through our, our human eyes, through our heart that is still stained and and wounded by sin, we look at other people and go, but they don't deserve for me to treat them better. 
they're getting what they deserve. Well, that's not what the Bible is telling you that we need to do. You don't treat others as they deserve. <laughs> I don't want to be treated as I deserve. We want to treat them better than ourselves. I want to treat them better than me. I want to lift them up. I want to look out for their interest. Man, that, that's hard too. I, that's very simple, right? Look out for the interest of others. Okay, that's difficult. <laughs> I know what I want. I know what I need. I have my interest. And sometimes my interest and your interest might be opposing. <laughs> so how do I look out for your interest? I, that's It's a simple concept. And like so much of what Jesus taught, it's not that we don't understand what he meant. It's that we don't like it. <laughs> I don't want to do that. That's hard for me. Now, we go on, and okay, that that's a tough one. We can lay that one aside. So that one's, we're going to have to work on that. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.20. And I always come back to this when I think about the relationship that we have as part of the household of faith, part of the, the church. What is our relationship with the world? Well, I think Paul perfectly sums it up here. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God. I, I love this picture because it's so clear. Uh, so clear. An ambassador does what? They, they don't have their own message the ambassador carries someone else's message. I'm here on someone else's behalf. Here is their message to you. That is what we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. And he, if, and just in case you don't understand that, he clarifies it. It says, though God were pleading through us. God's message comes through us. We implore you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. So we have the message that God has given be reconciled. And we're doing it in his stead, on his behalf. We are his ambassadors. Okay, that gives us a very clear picture of the life that we need to live in relationship to people around us. 1 Thessalonians 2.7 gives us a lot of the attitude that goes along with, with that. This is one of those passages that I just, uh, I love and I try to live this way. And it is, again, it's very simple, but it's very difficult. <laughs> it's very simple to understand, but very difficult to practice. Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Now, look at that. You, you see his heart so clearly there. We were gentle, like a mother with her baby. We were gentle with you. We, we gave you the truth, but it was gentle. And sometimes I feel like the church is criticized rightly for being harsh, uh, for bringing the truth with a hammer. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it's great that you can bring the truth. But I think this is the way that we bring it gently as a nursing mother, as, a, as someone who loves and cares for and really is imploring, as Second Corinthians 5 said, imploring, begging. We have this uh, affectionate longing that Paul talks about, uh, talks about. So he said, we loved you so much that we didn't just give you the gospel, but our own lives because we loved you so much. We have to ask the question, do we love the people around us that much? And sometimes I feel like the answer is no. We, we feel responsible or feel a duty maybe to share truth with them, but we kind of grudgingly slap them with the truth and then walk away because we don't actually care about them. We don't believe that they'll understand or hear or care. And we don't actually care if they do. We just want to do our responsibility. So, well, now it's my part's done. That is not the way that Paul approached them. Uh, again, it's, it's simple to, to understand. But, boy, that's a hard, hard path to follow. Now, when we think about the church and this second stage, particularly thinking about sacrifice and ministry, to learn and apply the one another's of the New Testament. And by one another's, I mean the many times that, well, the most often repeated one is love one another. When it says something, one another, that's what we mean by the one another's. Depending on how many you count in your translation stuff, I've heard up to 59 of these where most of them are love one another repeated. The one another's 
give a real picture of what the family of God should look like. When you hear Jesus said, it's by the love that you have for, for each other that the world will know that you are my disciples. Well, okay, what does that look like? I think the one and others give you that picture. It really takes time and proximity to build this kind of close personal relationship. Uh, in the middle of the world today, particularly we've come off the COVID pandemic and everybody's had a different experience with church for the last couple of years. And many, many people have gotten to the point where they, they're comfortable staying at home and maybe watching a sermon online. And they say, well, I can text my Christian friends. I can call. I can get all the truth. And if you're just transferring knowledge, the internet works great. It is a wonderful way to transfer knowledge. However, that is not what the relationship of the church is. And there is no way to live out the one another's really well without getting to know someone. It takes time, and I think it takes proximity. I think you really have to be in in person caring for each other. Now, there's something that's transmitted by our voice and our touch and our presence that is not transmitted, even if you say the same words, through a text or a phone call. So loving one another is the most often repeated, and it's the basis really for all of these commands we're to live, live by. So, you know, Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment. He said, Love the, God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, these are simple to understand. We keep coming back to that. It's very simple, but it's so hard to live this out consistently. consistently. So Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. And here again, you have that same idea we were talking about before. Can esteem others better than yourself. Give preference to one another kindly affectionate. You have that that gentleness that's given there uh, to love one another. And that's a foundation for what it means to be a Christ follower and to be part of his church. Galatians 5.13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, through love, because you love, as you love, serve each other. That's one of the things we're learning in this second stage, that life's not all about us. God has given you his forgiveness, his love, uh, his blessing, so that you can be a blessing to others. So we, we love others, and one way we love them is by serving them. Uh, Ephesians 4 has this... Uh, idea of loving one another and all that goes along with that, really all throughout Ephesians chapter 4, as really it talks about using our gifts to serve the church. But verse 1 or verse 2 talks about bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So bearing with each other, uh, forgiving one another um, is in verse 32. So we have this idea of, of patience and long-suffering and forgiving and, and bearing with one another. Love requires that because we're all, we're all terrible people. <laughs> we all basically at heart are selfish. The thing is, God is serious about our relationships. We are to teach one another, to admonish one another, to encourage one another, pray for one another, to live in harmony with one another, to build up one another. And in every way, God really genuinely intends for us to love one another. Going hand in hand with that, we need to learn the meaning and value of sacrifice. And I think it goes hand in hand with this idea of loving one another. Matthew 20, 25 Jesus called the disciples to himself, and he said, You know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many." If we are going to be followers of Jesus, this is our example. If you want to be a genuine follower, if you want to be obedient, if you want to be uh, someone who is known as great in his kingdom, you're to be a servant to the extent that you're willing to be a slave of others, to, to esteem them better than yourself. You serve them for their good, even when it costs you. 
Uh, I think that's something that's so hard for all of us because we are we are hard in our nature. We are selfish. Luke nine twenty three. This is just the core of what it means to be a disciple. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Again, we have the idea of denying yourself, of sacrifice, and taking up your cross. It's simple. It's a simple concept. But to do that consistent, consistently over a lifetime uh, just seems to elude most of us. We really struggle with that. I, maybe I'm just speaking for me. Are you really? Maybe you're not having that struggle. If you're not, write me and tell me your secret because I am certainly having that struggle of consistently setting aside my desires and taking up the cross and, and following Jesus. I, I don't find it to be easy. I find it to be a daily struggle, a daily challenge a daily need to look to God and ask Him through the power of the Holy Spirit to change me and to soften my heart and draw me to Himself. The good thing is that God does do that. He answers that kind of prayer. So one of the things that we see as we willingly surrender to to God and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life, we see then the fruit of the Spirit And the fruit of the Spirit really works out some of these same ideas we're talking about. The fruit of the Spirit is, first, in Galatians 5.22, is what? Love. And that's one of the things that we're striving to to practice with one another, to actually love and care for and do all the actions that go along with love. Well, that is a fruit of the Spirit. That is the result of allowing God, through the Spirit, to direct us. It goes on and says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. We need that. We deal with other people. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. So some of these things, even we already looked at, the being kind and gentle with other people, we see that as a result of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not, man, I'm just going to power through and I'm going to love people. Eh, I don't think it works that way. I think that's just about impossible. You might can love some people sometimes, but it's really, it's impossible to love all people all the time. God does that. And to the extent that we allow the Spirit to change us, to work in us, then I think we have the ability to do that. So, we go into verse 24, it says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. Just Galatians 5, 24. Again, goes back to that idea of sacrifice. Fruit of the Spirit comes hand in hand with this idea of sacrifice. We have to lay aside, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. I can't just go out and seek whatever I want and expect God really to work in me. Verse 25 there gives the summary that just, again, it's clear. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. You were saved by God. Continue to walk with Him. So sacrifice is putting God's eternal plan and purpose above my personal desires and goals. Sacrifice is loving others enough to do what's best for them, even when it's not in my best interest. And man, that's hard. I don't find that to be easy, but I find that to be a worthwhile goal to shoot for. The last thing today, in this second stage, we really should begin to find joy in serving. You know, this saying it's better to give than to receive, and I think we find joy as we give to others. One of the ways that we answer that question of how do we find joy in serving is to learn and grow and answer the question, what are my spiritual gifts? This is a good second stage question to ask. As a follower of Jesus, you have been equipped to build up the body of Christ. You have gifts that the church needs, and I don't believe you can, as a, as a mature believer, I don't think you can be a mature believer without learning to serve others and put your gifts to use. The desire to serve and use your gifts comes from really loving God and loving the people that he died for. So this, this joy that we desire is part of, a result of, this growth in Christ-likeness. So it's kind of, if in stage one you're learning who God wants you to be, in stage two you're learning to allow who you are in Christ to flow through you and to impact those around you. So all of these things we're looking at are the actions that go along with the reality of who we are in Christ. 
if it's genuinely true what God says about me, if I genuinely understand that and believe that to be true, then I can have the confidence to let go. I'm not working for someone else's respect. I'm not working for someone else's approval because I have God's approval. If stage one is, maybe you can see it as a classroom where there's things that we need to learn about God and who He is and the way the world really works, then I think you could see stage two is like a construction site. There's lots of activity. Stage one, in this classroom, you you put down a foundation. Stage two, you build on it. And there's a lot of activity. I mean, God tells us that He's building something great in our life. He's making us. He has made us a temple that He dwells in. Okay, that's incredible. That is awesome. So we're taking all of the truth that we learn in stage one and that we're continuing to learn. Again, we don't get away from that foundation. We're continuing to learn these things in stage two. We're continuing to grow an understanding of who God is. We're continuing to grow an understanding of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And as we grow in that, we relate to other people in a better way, in a healthier way, in a way that is more like the way that Christ relates to people. It means we look at them, and instead of seeing people to criticize or judge, we have compassion. Where does that come from? It comes from a greater understanding of God and what He's done, a greater understanding of how helpless I am without Him, and a greater understanding of how much He loves them. We begin to learn and apply these one another's to the church family. We understand this is God's family. He loves them. We can really love and pour out that love on God's family. We can serve them wholeheartedly. We can give preference to them. We can bear with them when they're wrong. We can forgive them uh, because God loves them. We become serious about those relationships. We really begin to love them to the point that we're willing to sacrifice for the cause of Christ. We see what God's doing is bigger than anything I can do. We see that what God is accomplishing is something that's worthwhile, and we're willing to get on board, to deny ourselves, and take up that cross of His mission and follow with Him. That's part of this second stage. And as we do that, I believe, really, as we mature, at some point along the way, in the beginning, serving might not be fun for you. But I think as we continue to do that and love other people and see God working, we find joy in that. We really, we really do find joy in serving Jesus. Next time, we're going to be looking at the third stage, spiritual maturity and reproduction. So thanks for joining me today. Check out runwithhorses.net for show notes and past shows. Write me at norman at runwithhorses.net if you have questions or comments. Join our Facebook community and tell a friend if you found this show helpful. We're looking forward to seeing how God continues to grow you in your life. Whatever you do, keep running.